All right, welcome to our introduction to free response questions for the AP Human Geography exam. The original PowerPoint was designed by Jared Wayland. It's based on information found in the book AP Human Geography, Preparing for the Advanced Placement Examination, edited by David Palmer. And the PowerPoint itself was edited and the lecture is by myself, Chris Gall. So when we ask what are the, what is the FRQ or what are the FRQs, um, a few key points you need to know. Number one is that there's going to be three of them on the AP Human Geography test in May, that you'll have an hour and 15 minutes to write those three questions, all three of them, in one hour and 15 minutes. So you have about 25 minutes per question. And your combined score on all three is worth about 50% of your overall AP test score. <clears throat> so within that um, 25 minutes, by the way, I should tell you that the time is yours to spend as you will technically. So if you spend more time on one question, it just means you have less time to answer another question. But every 25 minutes during this part of the test, the proctors are going to say, we, we would suggest you move on to question two or question three. So they will prompt you to move on to help you track time but they are not nobody's going to check over your shoulder and see if you're on question two or question three during that time so you can write the questions in any order you want and you can take as much time on them as you want knowing of course that you have a maximum of 75 minutes for all three it's also worth noting we talk about the combined score on all three being worth 50 percent of your overall ap test score that what that means is that Points on the FRQ portion of the exam are typically worth anywhere from two to four multiple choice questions that you get correct. Okay, so it's well worth your while to score good, to, to do a good job on these things, to score well on these things, um, and to figure out kind of how do I do that. <clears throat> so, what do these questions ask you to do? They're going to ask you to synthesize different topical answers. They're going to ask you to analyze and evaluate geographical concepts. They're going to ask you to supply appropriately selected and well-explained real-world examples to illustrate geographic concepts. And I, I emphasize that real-world piece because I teach ninth graders just south of Seattle, and oftentimes my kids will understand the definitions on an intellectual level, but they will not have real world examples. And so they'll want to substitute made up examples. And that doesn't work on the exam. Okay, readers cannot give you credit for made up examples. Um, you're also going to be asked to interpret verbal descriptions, maybe some maps, some graphs, some photographs, and or diagrams, right? And your responses are going to be in narrative form. So each FRQ is basically somewhere between has between two and four parts they're about a common theme okay and in general the writing gets more difficult and the thinking reaches a higher level the further you get down the list so part a will be the simplest and require the least writing typically and part d will be the most difficult and require the most writing that's not a hundred percent but it's a it's a pretty pretty good trend okay you're going to have to be able to combine information across units. That's really what that synthesize different topical areas means. It means you might have to take information from the population unit and talk about how it affects some concept or idea or model from the, the uh, economic unit or vice versa, right? You might have to take an urbanization model and use it to explain what's going on with population. <clears throat> okay, so you've got to be able to synthesize and, and move across different topical areas. As you're using this information from various units, right, one of the ways that you can help yourself prepare for this, by the way, is to look for ways that units overlap. So look for where you see different kinds of information or a different take on the same bit of information. Okay, and use that, leverage what you know from one unit to help you understand what's going on in a different unit. All right, so if you know, for example, what's going on with um, birth rates and death rates, 
as part of the population unit, you can leverage that to help you understand a little bit better what's going on with um, social development when you talk about economic geography and development levels and things like that. Okay. <clears throat> um, and you want to make sure that you've use examples. Examples are a great way to strengthen your argument. You don't necessarily need specific statistics, but you do need good examples. Okay. They should, again, always be real world examples. And it's worth noting that uh, the test readers are not allowed to give you credit for examples above and beyond what is asked for. So if it says two examples, they grade the first two examples and that's it. But they readers can consider them as evidence if maybe your first example, your earlier examples weren't strong examples. So you're right, but it's not the best example. Maybe that that extra example kind of puts it over the top and lets the reader know, yeah, this person really gets it. Okay. Um, you need to always write incomplete sentences. They are very explicit at the human at the reading that we are not to grade bullet points. Okay, so if it says identify three it, identify three countries that are semi periphery and you do bullet points, they're not going to give you credit for that. Okay, just to be clear, you need to use sentences. Write in narrative form. <clears throat> so. Some of the questions will have a stimulus. Okay, stimulus are those graphs, tables, photos, maps, things like that, that are going to aid in your answer. If they give you these, take the time to look at them. Look at them closely. Analyze them. Use them and make sure that you use them to do what the question asks you to do. Reference the stimulus in your answer because that's why they gave it to you. Okay, um, <clears throat> so if it's a picture and they ask you to identify something about the picture, identify it. If it's a table and they want you to look at what is the trend in the table and define it, define the trend in the table, but do what you get asked to do. Okay, some of the questions will be about geographic models. Okay. And they're going to ask you to do things like analyze, apply, or evaluate the model. <clears throat> okay, so you really need to know the models inside and out. It means you should recognize all of the major models by not only by the name of the model, but by the creator's name. And you should recognize if there's a diagram attached to it or a picture, you need to recognize that. Okay, um, if they don't, if they identify a model and there's a there's, you know, a picture or diagram to go with it, but they don't give that to you. Take a few seconds to sketch it out. You'd be surprised how having that visual will really stimulate your thinking, right? Um, <clears throat> so as you are writing these, we'll talk a little bit about layout, right? As you are writing these, make sure that all the parts of your FRQ are clearly labeled. Um, in a perfect world, it's not one run on paragraph. It ha if it has parts A, B, and C, then you should clearly have A, B, and C labeled. Readers are absolutely allowed to give you points in part C for th things that should have been in part A. Matter of fact, we're encouraged to do that. Okay. But what labeling does is it makes it much easier for the reader to be able to figure out where do you think the points are? Okay. What are you discussing where? So again, it's a courtesy. It really is a courtesy. Skipping lines between text or at a minimum between sections or between paragraphs, again, also a courtesy to the reader. Readers read hundreds of these things a day. Okay, and thousands over the course of the seven days that is the AP Human Geography reading. Anything you can do to make your um, answer more readable, like skipping lines, will make their day. Okay, it makes your handwriting easier to decipher. 
and if you have bad handwriting, slow yourself down, take some time to get in some practice, but write well, okay? The one exception, by the way, I should mention to the part about granting points later in an answer for a prompt that's found earlier is if you contradict something you wrote previously, okay? And um, if you give more examples than what are asked for, okay? So if it says three examples, we literally have to read the first three examples and that's what we count, okay? Um, we cannot count, you can't get answer one wrong and answer four right and have two, three, and four. You will only get credit for two and three. Okay, so that is the exception to that labeling thing. Okay. Um, and again, anything you can do to help the readers spot points and know where to find them and make your text easy to read is going to help you get more points. Okay, a few quick things about what you do have to do and what you do not have to do. Um, number one, you do not need an opening or closing paragraph. It's not an essay. There is no need for an introduction or a conclusion. Okay, you don't need to restate the question. You can start just by answering it. Now, that being said, if you are not a strong writer, it may help you to restate the question as a way to focus your response. <clears throat> If that will help you focus your response and get more points, do it. But just know that if you're a strong writer and you wouldn't otherwise need to restate the question to help with that, you don't have to. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we get copies of the prompt as part of the rubric. So we know immediately what you were responding to. Okay. Things that you do have to make sure you do. One is you have to avoid bullet points. Again, no points for bullet points, okay? Even if the prompt is worded in a way that indicates that that would be okay, trust me, it is not, okay? It is not okay. <clears throat> you need to make your thoughts and your connections explicit. It's not your regular teacher that's reading these things, okay? It's some stranger from probably from some other area of the country who is reading your essay. They're not, or your answers. They're not going to know what you know. So treat them like they're intelligent, like they have some general background knowledge, but not like they know all the exact same things you do. Be explicit. Okay. <clears throat> Be explicit. The readers are not mind readers. And again, not your teacher grading it. Okay. You do need to write neatly enough to be easily read or to be read. Okay. Readers are not required to grade papers that they cannot read. So that being said, they will pass them around. They will have other people take a look and see if other people can read your handwriting. But after they ask two or three people to read your handwriting and it can't be read, they're not reading it and you just won't get points. End of discussion. Okay. Um, so what you really need to do is be able to write neatly enough that it's, it's readable. It's readable. Okay. If you write sloppy, skip lines. Okay. Slow yourself down. You can, you can absolutely, there are ways to offset for that. So as we wrap things up here real quick, this has just been an introduction to free response questions. We've talked about what they are, what you're going to be asked to do, okay, um, the how you should use a stimulus if it's given to you, um, how to maybe use geographic models and things like that. We've also talked a little bit about how to lay out your answer and do's and don'ts. So if you have any questions, feel free to bring them into class, and I guess I will see you the next time I see you.